I'm Dr. Ronnie Dunn. Uh, I'm the executive director of the Diversity Institute at Cleveland State University, where I'm also an associate professor of urban studies in the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs. And yeah, so thank you for joining us. Um, and for our purposes, I would like to talk about your work um, with police and racial profiling and some of the things you've written about that. So if you could kind of give us an overview of, of your work in that um, area, and then we'll launch into some questions. Well, sure, sure. Uh, well, first, um, I'm, a, I'm an urban sociologist, so um, I've been uh, studying and doing research on the issue of policing at the intersection of policing and race and the criminal justice system uh, overall for over the past two decades, for over 20 years. And uh, actually my dissertation research, uh, it address the issue of racial profiling. I completed that back in uh, 2004. Um, and in it, I examined uh, the traffic ticketing patterns of uh, the Cleveland Police Department. And I, I, I felt, one, uh, I started this research in this area in the 1990s, about the mid 90s. And at the time we were in the midst of the war on drugs, uh, particularly the crack epidemic and uh, just uh, understanding uh, the disproportionate impact that some forms of policing were having in communities of color, particularly in the African-American community. So uh, I know at the time many uh, elected officials and uh, decision makers, although Blacks and Hispanics and others had been, uh, you know, uh, complaining and, and uh, this crying out about these issues for quite some time. At the time, the retort was always, well, that's, uh, you know, anecdotal uh, data or, or, you know, from aggrieved minorities or, or what have you. So it wasn't taken as seriously as it should have been. And uh, thus, I felt compelled in my research to provide uh, empirical data that uh, showed and supported the, uh, the fact that this is a real social phenomenon that Blacks and other people of color have been enduring for some time. So in essence, what I did in my dissertation research uh, was uh, conducted a study examining traffic ticketing patterns in the city of Cleveland covering a two-year period. Now, um, I initially obtained a database containing over 500,000 uh, citations in them. Now, out of those, uh, 180 plus thousand were uh, uniform traffic tickets. So I took that database and then uh, I was challenged with what to use as a benchmark uh, to compare the uh, driving, the racial demographics of the driving population against. So being a, a urban scholar, I utilized uh, a tool called uh, uh, and basically a transportation planners tool called the gravity model or travel demand model to help me measure the driving population for a given uh, geographic area. In this, in this case, the city of Cleveland. Now, uh, at the time, uh, Cleveland's driving population was drawn from a 13 uh, county region. Um, and the majority of Blacks and people of color lived in Cuyahoga County, the, uh, where Cleveland is, is uh, situated. So 
those other outlying counties, many of them, most have less than one to two percent people of color in them. So uh, while the majority of blacks in Cleveland at the time was a majority black city, um, and prior research studies have, uh, I argue, used an imprecise measure of the driving population using residential demographics to define the driving population. Well, we know all people in the city of Cleveland, all people, African Americans that reside in the city don't drive. So, uh, so thus I used to, to refine that measure, the driving age population drawn from that 13 county region. And I imputed that data with uh, US census data for those respective areas that contribute to the city's driving population and came up with what, um, was a relatively precise measure of the driving population by racial group. And needless to say, and I analyzed the data at three levels, city level, I actually purchased a radar gun and went out on two major thoroughfares that were used by primarily racially distinct driving populations to commute to the uh, central business district or downtown during the course of the business day. And, uh, and I also examined the traffic ticketing patterns by police precincts. And needless to say, uh, blacks were disproportionately ticketed at each level. So from there, uh, I thought of, OK, what are some uh, policy recommendations that can be implemented to help uh, address this, uh, uh, these disparities? So uh, having traveled particularly to the Washington, D.C. area for quite some time and being very familiar with it, I was aware that they had traffic cameras that they utilized there in D.C. And that is what prompted my uh, suggestion and recommendation, which I included in my dissertation, of implementing the use of traffic cameras to uh, provide an objective record of those that were uh, actually breaking the traffic laws, particularly either for speeding or running red lights, which traffic cameras, um, uh, certain types of traffic cameras would capture those offenses. So, uh, and speeding being the most frequent traffic violation by which people, motorists are stopped and the most conspicuous. And needless to say, the data in my study clearly showed while blacks weren't the majority of the driving population, they were the majority of those being cited for traffic traffic offenses, which, um, you know, at the time is, is what was used in the context of the racial profiling regime as a guise to uh, execute further police actions, investigating or searching for uh, drugs or evidence of, of guns or some other type of contraband at the time. So. So that uh, really was the basis of my uh, beginning to do research in the area of policing. And uh, since then, I've done, I've replicated that study at, on a number of occasions in different jurisdictions, uh, most recently in the city of Cleveland Heights. Uh, I think that was in 2020, I was contracted to uh, do a study uh, and, and work along with the city of Cleveland Heights to address some issues relative to policing. And it entailed that study as a component of that work, but it also, uh, we did anti-bias police training with the uh, police department there, as well as, um, reviewed and revised some of their uh, policing policies, specifically on use of force, uh, vehicle pursuit, uh, recruitment and hiring, and uh, I think there's one more that escapes me at this time. But uh, 
So that, and also, I also serve on uh, the Ohio Advisory Community Police Advisory Board. That is a body that was established by former Ohio Governor John Kasich in the wake of the uh, John Crawford III and police, uh, I'm sorry, Tamir Rice uh, police killings uh, back in 2014. Uh, at the time when, uh, in the wake of those killings, I uh, contacted and met with a former state senator, Nina Turner, and current state senator, Sandra Williams, who at the time was in the House, a state representative. And I called on them to call on Governor Kasich to establish a uh, a statewide task force on policing in that many aren't aware, but Ohio leads the nation in police jurisdictions that have come under federal consent decrees with Cleveland being but the latest. Uh, we're the fifth city in the state to uh, come under federal consent decree. Uh, the next two highest states were California and Montana with two each. So we more than double the number of agencies and other states that, or in those states that have come under DOJ guidance. So, um, we met in my office at uh, Cleveland State University on a Tuesday. Uh, that Thursday, they returned to Columbus and met with Governor Kasich. And that Sunday morning, he was on the Sunday morning talk shows announcing the establishment of the first of its kind uh, statewide uh, task force on policing in the nation. So uh, from there, he... Um, I was appointed to that task force, and we were charged to uh, hold town hall meetings across the state, and uh, we brought in expert witness and received testimony from uh, the community, uh, stakeholders in the community, as well as uh, expert witness and policing, and uh, we prov we wrote a report in four months. We had four meetings and different sections or regions of the state at public universities and in each uh, region, the first being held at Cleveland State in January of 2015. Uh, then we also met at Central State University, the one of the two HBCUs in the state of Ohio near Dayton. And then we met at the University of Toledo Lido and the University of Cincinnati. And from there, we wrote a report, over 600 page report was presented to the governor. Uh, four months later, then he, ex he signed an executive order, another one establishing the Ohio Collaborative on Community Police Advisory Board, which I was also appointed to and still serve on. I've been reappointed now, I think four times, being most recently reappointed by Governor DeWine. And and the uh, responsibility of that body is to establish statewide minimum standards uh, for the more than 100, uh, I'm sorry, more than 800 uh, law enforcement agencies across the state of Ohio. So uh, to date, uh, there's a certification process that uh, police agencies can go through and they can receive technical assistance. And that certification process is administered by the Ohio Criminal Justice Services uh, Agency out of uh, state, out of Columbus. And uh, just recently, the director, the executive director of uh, OCJS was just appointed the executive director of the uh, Federal Bureau of Justice Assistance. So um, that program, that initiative has had uh, considerable positive uh, uh, aspects to it or benefits thus far, I would say. Uh, we've established 12 standards to date, minimum standards, and we're currently working on uh, 
passing a youth interaction standard to establish uh, standards or protocols uh, that officers should uh, implement when interacting with youth and, and uh, juveniles. So. So I'm sure there's more that I could add, but I'll pause there to uh, entertain some uh, questions. Here. Well, uh, yes, it sounds like you're very busy. And thank you again for joining us. Yeah. Your, <laughs> having so much to do. Right. But I would like to uh, have you speak a little bit more about kind of something you touched on in, um, in what you were talking about, which is this idea of r racial profiling. Mm -hmm. And in the, the one article I read, and I thought it was really interesting that you kind of tie it to this idea of uh, freedom of mobility and liberty. Yeah. And then in regards to that, too, how some of these traffic stops, um, what results from them? So we have the data now that like African-Americans are being stopped more. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? And what does contact with the police mean? Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, thank you for that question, John. Well, the stop in and of itself is just the the, the beginning of what can be a very uh, detrimental downward spiral deeper into the criminal justice system. The most frequent uh, interaction the average citizen has with the criminal justice system comes in the form of a traffic stop. So there are um, un unseen or hidden uh, consequences or collateral consequences and costs that come along with those traffic stops, aside from the cost, the potential cost of the traffic fine itself. Um, in the state of Ohio, if you get more than 12 points on your driver's license over a two year period, your license are suspended. And you get anywhere from two to four points on your license for every moving violation that you, you receive. Well, that can have a very detrimental effect on anyone's livelihood. If you can just stop and think for a second about the impact that would have on you and your, your, your family, your household, your livelihood, if your driving privileges were suspended. Uh, so there, there, and we see that there's a, a larger economic cost. Uh, there's also the added insurance costs that from continual traffic violations, license suspension, uh, to get your driver's license reinstated, there's a, re a reinstatement cost of $250 per uh, reinstatement or, or incident. So that can quickly add up. And the thing is, uh, with the exception of large metropolitan centers or regions such as on the East Coast, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, and then uh, Chicago, or and maybe uh, San Francisco on the West Coast, uh, with the exception of large metro areas like that, the majority of the population commute or uh, use their personal vehicles or drive to uh, as their forms of transportation or mobility. So uh, once again, there's uh, imperative or incentives to drive. We have to drive pretty much. Um, we're a mobile society, so and the average person uses their their own private vehicle to to uh, meet their travel needs. So remove that, and then we see the the, the impact that it has. And once again, uh, if you're disproportionately being stopped, each stop uh, adds to that cost, and then. Once again, you're becoming more further and further involved with the criminal justice system. And as in the study that you cited, uh, we see that we found that blacks obviously are still driving, even after a license suspension. 
And uh, once again, it, it really becomes a matter of a uh, 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 self uh, uh, repetitive cycle that they're caught in. They're caught, their license are suspended, they continue to drive, their they, they cost is uh, increasing, uh, and uh, it's just a cycle that they're caught in. And uh, unfortunately, you know, many people that, but for these type of encounters and interactions are in essence law abiding citizens. But we're in, in a sense creating criminals or pe making people, putting people outside of the law. And once again, uh, reinforcing their involvement within the criminal justice system. And as we know, those have uh, dire uh, employment implications as well. And maybe we could tie, um, I've heard it often referred to as like a poverty tax. Yes. You know, because if you can't afford to get your license reinstated, but you need to keep driving, then it just, right. Right. if you can't afford $250, how can you afford the fine on top of it, right? Right, right, right. And there's been a number of um, anecdotal uh, studies and reports done. I know that uh, ProPublica, they uh, did a, a report, an investigative report. Um, it came out in 20 or 20, yeah, in 2020. And they cited some of my research in that, but uh, in it, they looked at some of the local uh, special police districts in Cleveland, particularly there in University Circle at Case Western Reserve University Hospitals, and how these police agencies also were disproportionately stopping Blacks, not only for driving, but uh, for uh, pedestrian stops, for jaywalking and things of that nature on their campus, there at Cleveland Clinic. And in it, they told the story of some individuals that were caught in this system and the impact that these type of uh, practices had on, on their lives. That's interesting. And when you suggested the, the traffic cams, were you, was this an idea of to minimize police contact or what was the, or was that just one of the answers? Yes. Well, yeah, absolutely. Uh, along with in, enhancing public safety, uh, those traffic cameras, once again, can reduce the unnecessary contact and interaction between police and citizens. As we know, many of these tragic police shootings that have resulted in death uh, stem from traffic stops. Uh, uh, Philando Castile and outside of, I think, St. Paul, outside of Minneapolis. And then uh, here in Ohio, uh, I think his name, Samuel DeBose in Cincinnati. Uh, so, you know, those types of uh, mechanisms can help address many aspects of the problems associated with uh, uh, racial profiling and just uh, inordinate or disproportionate contact between citizens and the police. Um, and those interactions are some of the most uh, fraught encounters on both sides of the equation, both for the citizen and the police, because the police often are, they're, they're dealing with the unknown. There's a lot of unknown elements in those traffic stops. So uh, it's something, if we can reduce the unnecessary interactions between police and citizens in that sense, I think it, it would be uh, very beneficial for the society overall. And they did put in cameras for a while, but what happened? Yes, to they did. Now therein lies the other problem. <laughs> Not only is it's the administration and the placement in the cameras. Uh, prior, and I write about this in my book, which I I wrote a. It, it came out in 2010, but it was based off of my dissertation research. I. Uh, 
spoke with the majority of the African American council people in the city at the time. At the time, we had a 21 person council, um, 11, I think, of which were African American or 10 African American and one Hispanic. Well, the one thing about Cleveland, you could personally know, <laughs> you know, a lot of our council people. And at the time, I did. I, I knew virtually all of the African-American council people. And I spoke with them and the then council president who later would become mayor, Frank Jackson, I spoke with Frank Jackson at length uh, in the locker room at the YMCA, which we both attended. <laughs> and I, I talked to him for 20 minutes when it was announced that uh, his predecessor, the uh, Jane Campbell, the Campbell administration, was actually going to implement the use of uh, the traffic cameras. Um, and I told him and the other council people that I spoke with regarding that, uh, do not allow them to base the placement of those cameras in the areas where the traffic tickets have traditionally been written because the data clearly shows that it was biased. So if you concentrate all of your uh, traffic enforcement units or traffic stops in the areas and on those thoroughfares primarily used by African-Americans, then it's no surprise you're disproportionately going to target or ticket uh, that population. So unfortunately, they didn't heed my uh, admonition, uh, my warnings, and uh, they based the majority of the cameras on the east side of Cleveland, a city which is historically and still is racially segregated. We're among one of the most racially segregated cities in the country. And uh, those cameras then just reinforce some of the bias already found in the ticketing patterns. Now, I did request the uh, traffic camera data six months after they had been in place to study what impact it was having. And I made that request on at least three separate occasions and never received the data from the administration. So, uh, but I'm pretty certain it did have that adverse uh, unintended uh, effect. So uh, once again, that is uh, what I consider the perversion of an otherwise objective uh, system that could be utilized to provide equity in, in the administration of, uh, in this sense, uh, traffic enforcement and in general public safety. So, uh, but that was voted down by the residents in 2009, the use of those traffic cameras, I'm sorry, in 2014. And those cameras were in place nine years. The nine years they were in place, they generated between six and $10 million per year for the city. And another problem with the administration of those cameras was uh, the, the uh, city allowed and council allowed the council person to determine whether or not those cameras were implemented or utilized in their district, in their wards. If the city was going to adopt this use, it should have been a universal program and the placement of those cameras should have been based on um, three criteria. One, the, those areas, thoroughfares with the highest volume of traffic and accidents, traffic accidents, as well as in school zones. Otherwise, it should have been a universal program. Uh, the traffic accident data, that data is uh, obtained and uh, compiled by NOACA. That's the very same agency that I use to get the travel demand models, the, the gravity models from. So that data was and is available. And that should be the basis for any uh, municipality that is implementing the use of traffic cameras in their jurisdictions. I argue that 
those should be the criteria by which the uh, placement of those cameras are, are based. And uh, to my uh, surprise, actually, Cleveland was just the first city in the state to utilize the cameras. And it, it was quite something to see your research uh, move from research to policy and then to just see it take on a life of its own as it's gone throughout the state. And then hear politicians debating the uh, merits of it, the legal constitutionality of it. It's been uh, several bills introduced to the legislature to repeal the use of the cameras and um, it's gone to the U.S., um, I'm sorry, the state Supreme Court, I know at least, I think on two separate occasions and uh, it's been upheld thus far. And one governor, Governor Taft actually vetoed a bill to overturn their use on his last day in office. So it's been quite interesting. Well, that's a, that's a good place to leave it. I, I would like, um, if you have any um, words of optimism or hope, are things getting better or are we, or how can we make them better? Uh, yes, well, um, I in this work, and that's one thing in the racial justice uh, arena, you have to always have optimism or else <laughs> where are we left? So uh, cautious optimism is is the uh, how I like to describe my uh, my sense of of where we are and hopefully where we will go. Um, I, I mentioned uh, consent decrees, federal consent decrees. I'm currently serving on the Cle uh, Cleveland police monitoring team overseeing the implementation of the consent decree in the city of Cleveland. Uh, that is, at the time is our greatest hope for reform of uh, policing. And mind you, the thing is, Policing is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, the police are the most ubiquitous agents of the state and the criminal justice system. So, uh, you know, it would stand to reason we would start there. And the police are under a great amount of scrutiny at present. So we now have a critical mass that are focused on the police, the front end of that continuum, the criminal justice continuum. But now we need to go further into the criminal justice system and examine each decision maker and decision point along that continuum. The prosecutor, uh, the courts, the judges. I spoke uh, before uh, an audience of uh, judicial candidates last week on behalf of the NAACP and cited uh, county uh, court de uh, data, state and county data that showed the racial disparities of blacks involved in the county and the state's criminal justice system. And uh, Ohio, um, Cleveland and Cuyahoga County had the dubious distinction for quite some time, particularly under the war on drugs regime of uh, at committing the, the, the highest percentage of our citizens to our state prisons. So uh, that, that dynamic has shifted some uh, as of 2010. And uh, now we account for, uh, I think it's about 11% of the state's prison population, which is uh, more in line, we, we're 11% of the state's population. So uh, it's more, more in line there. But for most of the 2000s, the 90s and 2000s, we accounted for 21% of the state's prison population, more than double uh, or more than that of Franklin and Hamilton County, which is Cincinnati and Columbus combined. So, so yeah, we, we, we have, we've made some progress, but we still have a long ways to go. Uh, that is until we get some federal legislation, something done at the federal level, um, I think we have to continue to work and push the, uh, these type of initiatives at the state and local level.